long story short, my career has been 20 years um, forecasting the future and doing strategy and innovation, um, helping mega brands around the world uh, make more money. And in the last 10 years, however, I've noticed that the when you're developing strategies and innovation pipelines, the ACE card in those those in that work is increasingly sustainability. So it's become a very important consideration, um, obviously for businesses and um, and in my mind around what does that really mean and what does it really mean to help businesses grow. After the pandemic, a lot of the smaller businesses seem to be priced out by the bigger players, and now with the gas companies, we're finding the greener companies are the ones collapsing. Are there any opportunities for smaller sustainable companies to come through or are they going to be continue are they continually going to be priced out by the bigger players? Yeah, this is one of the big challenges is picking the fight and where, where, where do we work most? And I think if we think about this whole challenge systemically, finding the right areas to either talk about this stuff or, or go in and work on these things, I think a lot of it comes down to where, where does the money flow from? And if it's about investment from the governments or investment from investors, I'm finding that that's an interesting intervention point is to help there to educate those giving the money or feeding and saying, um, you know what, the criteria for success is going to change. And then I think all of a sudden the big incumbent businesses start to say, well, my shareholders are giving me pressure that I need to change. Um, but the big, the big change, however, is going to come when one of the one of the mandates within my framework is is governance, and governance is usually um, and also liability is usually um, described as protecting shareholders from you know risk and making sure that we protect our business to a new type of sense of governance, which is making sure that we protect those businesses that are you know insurgents and actually changing the nature of things. So I think, I think that's going to be one of the most important things is big companies who pay governments and lobby to keep their businesses going, start switching and saying, well, you know, all ships have to rise and we have to help our industry change versus protect ourselves. And that's obviously a, a very big concept of togetherness and being united that I try and plug in. But um, yeah, you, you kind of pick the... <laughs> The, the fundamental shift that's going to have to happen. Um, Thank you. Hey Tom, yeah, I, I was just wondering what you think. Um, in th there's been like a massive change in uh, consumers caring about like the ethics of companies over the last like ten years or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, in like ten years' time, do you think people will just boycott any company that's unethical? Like, how, how far do you think it's going to go in terms of what customers let businesses get away with? The first thing that will happen is. Um, employees will stop working there. So when you're thinking about talent, those that talent either coming out of university or job switching or career changing will start to say, I don't know if I want to work in this company anymore because my children or my friends are giving me such a hard time working in this industry that I need to get out. Um, and either they'll go and run off to the mountains and say, I'm going to run an NGO, or they'll just be smart and work in the green industries um, or the industries that are greening. Um, and then the consumers will come. And then the consumers, I think, are very blind to what is going on. They, they go into their supermarkets or their shops. They want what they want, and they don't think systemically. That, that we, we shouldn't blame them for that. Um, and therefore, I think the pressure will come later. There are some industries, however, that are very hot, for example, food and, for example, fashion, whereby it's a bit more of an emblem you're wearing who you are. So I think to sort of, in the consumer sense, boycotting can be much easier when it's like, well, I'll just switch out the jacket that I'm wearing for a jacket that is gonna mean I get more likes on Instagram and more friends, because if I wear this jacket, I'm, just, I'm not gonna have any friends. So I think that switch is gonna be more obvious, but the really, the big stuff, for example, car ownership and flying around the world and, all those harder things to try and not do because we like doing them or some of us like doing those things. Um, there's big compromises that I think just affect lifestyles too much. You know, I live in the middle of, in the middle of nowhere in Norway and I need a car, <laughs> you know, and it's hard to sort of, even in, even in Norway with a 70% EV penetration whereby everyone has an electric vehicle, um, next year the subsidies stop on that. So you have to start paying tax next year. So 
the government said, we'll pay the tax. And that's why there's so many EVs here. So the, I think consumers are, the boycotting thing is, is they need to be incentivized, you know, and nudge, nudge theory is a big thing. How do we nudge consumers towards the right place? And there's obviously a lot of theory and conversations around that as well. So it's a, it's a game of multiple, multiple chips here. Mm. In terms of talking about these life, larger companies who have uh, the biggest footprint, um, um, where are they in terms of their awareness of the threats? Like, are there actually big, like the Amazons, similar company to those who are taking concrete steps to do something right now? Or is it just all, are they not really aware of um, the potential threat that this could have uh, down the line? Um, and my second question was, you said um, in your talk about uh, some industries might not survive the next 10 years or so. Um, could you go on more into that? Which industries would those be? And yeah. The threats are getting clearer. I think the IPCC report this year was pretty clear in terms of this is code red for humanity. Um, the scientists are getting better at communicating and making it a bit easy to understand. Um, obviously, we have, we have tensions coming from the employees, workforces of the world saying, we don't want this anymore. Um, and then you have the legislation coming, which I think is getting a little bit clearer. But there are some industries, for example, I mentioned like cement, textiles, steel, food manufacturing, um, pet petrochemical production, transportation. These are all industries that their entire value chain is redundant because a lot of them are based on coal and gas and oil. So on the one hand, those industries that are, that are making those industries exist will be so taxed and so legislated that you cannot get your raw material for the company that you're running. So it's not just saying that, say, say for example, textiles, um, it would exist in cotton and things like that. It's because they can't actually get the product. They can't get the manufacturing of the things they need to make their fashion items. Um, or if you look at something like cement, it's going to be so legislated in the next five years that it, companies who are cement giants, they won't be allowed to run their companies or they want, they'll have to pay incredibly high taxes. So, so I think the insurance conversation around all this is quite interesting, which is insurers are now starting to raise the level of ins the, the cost of insurance of some industries to such a level that it's insurable. <laughs> So if that answers your question, I think it's, it's, it's sort of getting, it's getting, it's getting clear what the burning platforms are. And whenever, to be honest with you, one of the, the, the things I've often done is you go into a company in their board level and you show them the burning platform and you say, now, now should we talk about the risk of not doing this? And I think um, I'm, fi I'm finding how many more times does that risk conversation need to be played um, before companies say, okay, this is time to actually stop and come to come to this mountain range and try and go up the mountain. Um, to be really honest with you, I think the big challenge is that at five o'clock, people go home and they have their dinner and they want to watch Netflix and they want to go to bed and read a book or be with their children or whatever, or go out and drink. Um, and they switch off from thinking, well, today I had to deal with climate change and I'm going to go now. And that's that's the... The kind of responsibility thing is how far do you let this in as a leader so that you then wake up the next day saying you know what i've decided to turn off this this and this and our company doesn't run like that that and that anymore and that boldness is very very rare because of stakeholder shareholder pressure and things like that so um great companies orsted used to be called the danish oil and national gas company dong great name and they decided to change the name and cut off all coal and, and um, oil production and now they're 100 green it took eight years to do um and it's a great case study because they literally went no more and they turned off the, the the supply chain and said we don't want to make money out of that anymore but you can imagine all the shareholders going <laughs> okay uh, did, did their share prices take a hit or, or did they or right. normal for that now they're now the most valuable companies in the world so it's, it's one of these things of like you've got to do it and then but it requires a certain type of leadership. Tom, you mentioned the, <clears throat> the right leadership. Do you feel confident that the, the right leadership will be coming up through the ranks, you know, with the younger generations joining the workforce? I think it's a mindset versus an age. Um, 
a lot of the books I've read about this, because I spent last year reading around this fully to understand what are the techniques and tools required to move people up this mountain, metaphorically, right? And I hate to say it, but there are two massive reasons why leaders get it. And one of the reasons is, sorry, it's a bit in there though. One of the reasons is um, something has happened to them personally, i.e. health-wise or mentally, or something has happened in their family, a death or an illness or something, and it's made them go, I need to change. And that's called a conscious shock. Um, and that is, you can't manufacture that. That will happen if it happens, and it's very unfortunate if it happens. But 99% of leaders who have gone, it's time to change, is because something mentally or physically has happened to them. And I think when you look at the big leaders who are bleeding in this space, they have a they have a story to tell that said it's all because of this reason why. So I think creating the conditions for for people to see what we're talking about, be united, be like I said before, eager, be intrepid, be brave, be courageous, see the other side of the mountain, all those sorts of things. Creating those conditions requires all leaders in a company to work together to create that. Um, and I mentioned governance. I think if you're a board member right now, or if you're a leader, creating the conditions for the other leaders to just look around the corner or just look over the mountain and say, can we just for a second not talk about next week and just, just look beyond? And just to your point, your question, Mo, um, about the risks and the opportunities, doing that regularly, I think it starts to sink in. So yes, there are younger generations who are saying, when I get my hands on the empire, I can really shift. But there's also leaders who are already there who are working really hard to create these conditions, or at least this, this view, that this chance to see, to see ahead. Um, my, bread and, my bread and butter is doing that. Um, but there's also a lot of leaders who say, I've been trying to do this too, so yeah. Great, thanks so much for that, Tom. That was really interesting.